And I'm gonna eat pizza before I start. Though. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how do I record it? Everything's going. Yeah. Are most people here or not yet? All right, we can wait another few minutes. Was it like half med students, half residents? All right, so we're going to talk about a really um, fun topic today. Uh, so we'll talk about ALS and a little bit about motor neuron diseases in general. Um, please feel free to ask any questions. Um, so, uh, there's a good Continuum article. I, I know all the residents know about Continuum. Um, I highly recommend uh, really keeping reading up on it. Uh, it's every two months they come out with a new edition. It's a little too detailed for the med students. You don't need to know about it, but for the residents, it's really great. Um, and so they had an article on ALS in 2017, uh, which I thought was uh, really fantastic. So I recommend reading it. So this figure is from that article. Um, so it really shows the spectrum of motor neuron disease, right? So motor neuron disease is, is a disorder of the motor neurons. So there's motor neurons in the motor cortex, in the brainstem, and in the uh, spinal cord. So if you have dysfunction of the motor neurons in the motor cortex, that's going to cause upper motor neuron signs and symptoms. And if it affects the brainstem or the spinal cord, that'll cause lower motor neuron. So classic ALS, and we'll talk about all the different subtypes, but classic ALS presents with upper and lower motor neuron, and there's a sporadic, which is about 90 to 95% of cases, and inherited, which is five to 10% of cases. So that's kind of why it's in the middle over here. There's a whole spectrum of motor neuron disorders, and they're classified based on sporadic and inherited and upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. So there's a upper motor neuron variant of ALS called primary lateral sclerosis, 
tends to have a better prognosis than classic ALS. And on exam, they're going to be very, they're going to have spasticity. Um, they're going to have uh, upward planters, positive Hoffmans. Uh, they might have some weakness, but it's going to be more the spasticity that's really impressive. And that's, that's sporadic. It's really a diagnosis of exclusion. There's no test that's going to tell you that this is primary lateral sclerosis. The inherited version of primary lateral sclerosis is hereditary spastic paraplegia. So I don't know if you've ever seen cases of that. It, it, it tends to be more of an outpatient diagnosis. They don't really end up in the hospital. Um, there's many, many different types of HSP. There was an article in Continuum about it, which is way over my head because there's like 50 types. Um, they are broken down into complicated and non-complicated types. So the complicated HSPs tend to have different, uh, be it cognitive or sensory or other uh, neurologic symptoms. Um, and you can actually do genetic testing. I, I think I diagnosed my first or second HSP two weeks ago through genetic testing. Um, so they typically present more with spasticity in the legs. Um, the arms tend not to be affected as much. The lower motor neuron variant of ALS is progressive muscular atrophy, uh, PMA. So they're gonna present with all lower motor neuron features. So they're gonna have painless weakness similar to classic ALS, but you're not gonna see the hyperreflexia or the increased tone or the upward uh, Babinski. Polio and West Nile virus are other examples of lower motor neuron syndromes. And then you have these inherited lower motor neuron disorders like SMA, spinal muscular atrophy. You know, if you come to the MDA clinic on Tuesday afternoons, we have some patients with SMA. And so, right, right, and so that's a separate topic. That's not really this topic. Uh, but, you know, there's four different types. Um, and it's actually quite an exciting field, right? Because now we have treatment for it. So now we have gene therapy for it, which is, uh, which is incredible. When I was a med student, it was, you know, it was hopeless. Um, and then uh, spinobulbar muscular atrophy, also known as Kennedy disease, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Uh, so the epidemiology of ALS, so the incidence is about 0.6 to 3.8 per 100,000 person years. Um, there was a, so an, another thing that you can read up on, and it's a little bit more specific, but the uh, current opinions of neurology just had a whole entire um, uh, issue on ALS. And so it went into all the different facets of it. Um, so it came out a few months ago, um, which was really nice to present this talk to prepare for it. Um, but in case you want to read else. Um, so there was actually a study in there showing that the incidence is possibly increasing. Um, the prevalence tends to be about four to eight per 100,000. And it tends to affect uh, people of European ancestry more than um, Hispanics or, um, or African-Americans. Um, male to female ratio is about 1.7 to about one. Uh, it tends to affect men more than women below 60 years old or so. And then after 60, it's a little bit more of a one-to-one -one ratio. And the mean age of onset is between 51 and 66. So you typically hear about it in someone who's in their 50s or 60s, but honestly, it can be any age. Um, so in residency, I saw a patient who was 25, and you can see patients who are in their 90s. So about 90 to 95% of cases, as I suggested, are sporadic. Um, but that does leave a, a decent chunk that are familial. Um, the mutation that I learned in med school was SOD1, so right, so superoxide dismutase 1. Um, but that actually only accounts for about 12% of the um, genetic causes. And so the most common that we know of is uh, the C9ORF72, uh, chromosome 9, open reading frame 72. And that's going to appear on, I don't know if it'll appear on the med school exa med student exams on the shelf, but it'll definitely appear on the boards. Um, more so than the SOD1, actually. Um, this tends to actually also be a mutation seen in some of the frontotemporal dementia um, cases. And as we'll talk about, there really is a lot of overlap between ALS and FTD. Um, you know, 15% of patients with ALS actually fit the diagnostic criteria for FTD. And about 50% have actually some uh, executive dysfunction if you, do, um, if you do a cognitive exam on them. Um, and then you'll see the C9ORF72 uh, mutation in some patients with FTD who don't even have any weakness, who don't have any uh, phenotype of ALS. Um, some newer genes that are discovered over here. I'm not going to, you can see them if you, uh, over here. Um, and sporadic ALS, some percentage of sporadic ALS cases will actually have some of these mutations, uh, be it due to low penetrance or if we don't know of uh, uh, the family history very well, or just a, a new uh, novel mutation. Um, when it comes to the pathophysiology of ALS, you know, we don't know very well uh, what the pathophysiology is. We, we suspect it's a combination of genetic susceptibility and, and um, environmental exposure. 
we know that there are some risk factors. So we know the two big risk factors are as we get older, so older age, although obviously not the very elderly, but older age once you hit in the 50s, and male sex, and um, obviously a positive family history. We believe that smoking is also a risk factor. And then we believe that repeated head trauma is a risk factor. So we see that in veterans, they tend to um, have a much higher prevalence of ALS than non-veterans, um, as well as uh, soccer players, football players, um, and the like. So, you know, we think that there's some defect in RNA processing when it comes to the pathophysiology of ALS. Um, there's also this actually, um, uh, an article that just came out in the Lancet Neurology uh, a few months ago in 2019, uh, looking at immune dysregulation in ALS. And so we think that there's activated CNS microglia and astroglia and inflammatory reactions um, that have some role. Um, and we think that at first we have, it's this protective anti-inflammatory response and then it, it becomes more of a pro-inflammatory response and, and can lead to the development of the uh, clinical symptoms. So uh, this is another uh, figure from that, from that continuum article. And so this looks at all the different phenotypes of ALS. So the most common phenotype is this classic ALS where you get upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron. Most of those cases tend to be more limb. So it starts out either in an arm or a leg. Uh, so, you know, whenever someone presents with a foot drop, you know, it's most likely not ALS, right? But that's gonna be somewhere in the back of your head as a possible differential, um, right? The, with a foot drop, you're gonna think of a, a fibular neuropathy of the um, uh, fibular head, or you're gonna think of an L5 radiculopathy. Other less common causes are like sciatic neuropathy or lumbosacral plexopathy, but ALS is something else that you think about. And then just hand weakness, right? That's another limb onset presentation of ALS. And there's also a differential for that. And there's a large differential for that. Um, and but those, those are the most common presentations. And again, it's gonna be painless weakness, right? There's not gonna be any numbness or tingling. Um, and you can get pain in ALS, but it's not usually like the burning neuropathic pain that we think of in other neuro peripheral neurologic disorders. Um, a certain percentage of these classic ALS cases are gonna have a bulbar presentation, and they tend to progress a little bit faster than the limb presentation. Um, so they, they have a little bit of a worse prognosis. There is a separate progressive bulbar palsy that is, can have a similar prognosis to ALS, or it can be a little better. Uh, some of these patients will present with dysarthria and dysphagia, and they're gonna be, again, pr predominantly bulbar, and some of them will just stay like that for years. Um, although a decent chunk will then progress to limb onset afterwards. About 1% of ALS cases have a respiratory onset, and not surprisingly, that's gonna be the worst prognosis. Um, so they're gonna present with, uh, with weakness and diaphragmatic involvement. Um, we talked a little bit about PMA and PLS already, so progressive muscular atrophy and primary lateral sclerosis. Progressive muscular atrophy is probably about 5% of all ALS cases. And so it's, again, it's gonna be really this lower motor neuron presentation. If you follow them over years, um, some of them will have a similar prognosis to classic ALS, and some of them will have a little bit of a better prognosis. And after a few years, some of the upper motor neuron signs and symptoms will start to develop. Uh, PLS tends to have a much better prognosis. So these patients can have, they, they can survive for 20, 30 years and really just be this, have this upper motor neuron predominance. We have a few of them in the MDA clinic. There's this um, flail arm syndrome. We have a few of these in the MDA clinic as well. Uh, brachial amyotrophic diplegia. So they tend to have weakness in one arm. It tends to be proximal. So a patient I saw about three years ago was referred to me from an orthopedic surgeon um, because he thought there was a shoulder issue because she was having trouble lifting up the arm. So he performed surgery and then it didn't get any better. And so she had you know, proximal weakness of that arm, a little bit of distal weakness, and she started to develop some proximal weakness of the other arm. So that's the classic brachial amyotrophic diplegia. Um, so it's painless like all other ALS, progressive weakness really in the proximal arms where they, they can't move proximally, but they, they're better distally. Um, and again, these patients tend to do better. You know, I diagnosed her about three years ago and she's pretty stable. Um, flail leg syndrome is a leg variant of that. I don't think it's as common. Um, it, it can often be actually more distal compared to uh, brachial amyotrophic diplegia, which is more proximal. Um, a very small percentage will have this dropped head syndrome where it starts out with head weakness. Um, and then this pseudopolyneuritic ALS, I had to look up before I presented this talk. Uh, it's another name for flail leg syndrome. It's about the same thing. Um, and then you have this ALS frontotemporal dementia spectrum, um, which we see. 
So classic ALS is, again, this upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron um, combination. Uh, the spinal form is most common, um, and about 20 to 30 percent is bulbar and 1 percent is respiratory. So the median survival, we say, is about three to four years, maybe two to four years. Um, here we see I have 20 to 48 um, months. Although, you know, when I counsel patients, there is variability. So about 10% will survive for about 10 years or longer. 20 years is a tiny percentage, but you see it every once in a while. Um, some of the prognostic signs, so weight loss is a very poor prognostic sign. And in general, actually having a higher BMI is a better prognostic sign. Um, being a little younger is a better prognostic sign. And um, not surprisingly, spinal onset is better than a bulbar onset or respiratory onset. Um, the familial versus uh, sporadic forms of ALS, there's a lot of heterogeneity uh, in it. Um, so the C9ORF mutations, they tend to be a little younger. They tend to progress a little bit faster. SOD1, it really depends. So that's not necessarily a prognostic sign. And as I said before, 15% actually have a diagnosis of FTD, meet diagnostic criteria. Um, and it's classically more the behavioral variant than the primary progressive aphasia. Um, and about 50% actually do have cognitive symptoms if you looked into it a little bit more. Um, so bulbar, so, you know, when we diagnose ALS, and I'll go into this a little bit more, we, we have two different criteria. So we have the ellis criteria, which came out in the 90s, and we have the Awaji criteria, which came out about 10 years ago. The Awaji criteria tends to be a little more sensitive and specific. And the idea is that you're going to find, and it, the, these criteria are really, one of the critiques is that it's more for the classic ALS compared to these other variants. Uh, because, it's, you know, the Awaji criteria and the ellis criteria are looking at upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron signs, which you don't necessarily get in all these variants. So in upper motor neuron, it's more clinical, right? It's more the clinical signs you see. So it's going to be signs of upper motor neuron disease, right? So it's going to be... Um, Hyperreflexia, I don't know what that was. Um, hyperreflexia, uh, upward plantar, right, a Hoffman's. Um, from a cranial perspective, you might get an exaggerate, exaggerated gag reflex. Uh, you might get a snout reflex. You might get that pseudobulbar affect, which is when they're, they're crying or they're laughing inappropriately. Um, and you can actually get these forced yawns, which can be an upper motor neuron bulbar sign. Um, and then in the thoracic, you might get loss of that abdominal reflex. Um, that can be an upper motor neuron sign. And then for the lower motor neuron signs, it could be clinical, but that's where EMG is really important because we can see l evidence of lower motor neuron dysfunction on EMG. Um, other clinical signs and symptoms that you often see is fasciculations, right? So that's like classic. We think of fasciculations in ALS. There is benign fasciculation syndrome where patients just have fasciculations kind of diffusely. And then there's like every neuromuscular fellow like me. So we all think we have ALS at one point because if you're anxious, you get fasciculations and then you see the fasciculations and you get more anxious so the fasciculations continue. And then we all think we have ALS. Um, and then muscle cramping. So pain is actually something we see with ALS and we get cramping um, pretty often. Um, so PMA, we talked about a little bit. Um, and so it's, it's pretty similar to ALS. It's just that lower motor neuron variant. Um, and in a prospective study, uh, within six years, a lot of them developed upper motor neuron features. Uh, but that's actually saying something, right? Because that, that means that the prognosis is a little better than the, uh, than the classic ALS. And so if you look at it, some of the patients end up being pretty similar prognosis, some are a little better. Um, okay. So differential diagnosis of ALS. So this is really important, right? Because in general, ALS is pretty poorly diagnosed. It's mostly a clinical diagnosis with the help of EMG, and it's really ruling out other things. And so it, on average, takes probably about a year for patients to get that diagnosis from when they first start presenting to a doctor. Um, and you know, where I did residency, we tended not to really diagnose patients with ALS that much. We didn't have an ALS specialist. So we would say, oh, you know, there's a possibility that there's something serious going on. Why don't you get a second opinion somewhere else? Um, and I, you know, I think that was actually, I think that's actually pretty common. I think a lot of neurologists are kind of afraid to give that diagnosis in case they're wrong, especially. Um, and also because it's just, a, it's a hard, it's a hard diagnosis to give. Um, so when you come up with a diagnosis, you want to rule out other things, right? So a differential diagnosis of classic ALS where you get upper motor neuro, 
upper uh, motor neuron and lower motor neuron features, that's, that's oftentimes when you think of a myeloneuropathy, right? A myelopathy plus a neuropathy. So the things in the differential are gonna be things that cause myeloneuropathies. So one is a vitamin B12 deficiency, right? Where you can get, um, it, it can affect the spinal cord and cause a peripheral neuropathy. Copper is the other classic one, right? Uh, that can be due to zinc toxicity or it could just be due to copper deficiency on its own. Cervical spondylitic uh, myelopathy is a really important one. So when you think of ALS, you're thinking of upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron features. That's important. But more importantly, it should be in the same limb, right? So you should be getting a weak atrophied arm that has reflexes, which is surprising, right? When you have atrophy and weakness in an arm, you shouldn't get reflexes. So that's upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron in one limb. The same thing in a leg. Cervical spondylitic myelopathy, right? If you have cervical spondylosis in the C-spine at C5, you can hit those nerve roots as it leaves at C5, and you can hit the spinal cord. And that's gonna cause lower motor neuron signs in the arms at that level, and upper motor neuron signs below it in the legs. So that's a patient with upper and lower motor neuron signs, but that's not consistent with ALS, right? In ALS, if anything, you should get it in the same limb, or you should get it so that upper motor neuron signs maybe are in the arms, and then you're getting some lower motor neuron signs in the legs because that doesn't fit with cervical spondylitic myelopathy. So most patients with this type of presentation, they're gonna get an MRI of the C-spine. You know, if someone has classic ALS, you probably don't need to, um, but this is something you wanna think about. A syrinx, right? So a syrinx in the C-spine can, so, you know, back when none of us were born, syringomyelia is, can present it quite often and can present actually in a very impressive manner, right? Because if you think about a syrinx in the central canal, as it gets bigger, you're hitting the anterior commissure where the spinal thalamic tract goes, right? So that's where you get those classic presentation where you get loss of pain and temperature in the shawl in this area. If that continues to get bitter, bigger, right? You're gonna eventually hit the anterior horn cells. So you're gonna get lower motor neuron symptoms in, at that level. And if it gets bigger than that, you're gonna hit the lateral corticospinal tract. So before we had MRIs, you would actually see these presentations where you get lower, mo lower motor neuron weakness in the arms and upper motor neuron weakness in the legs. I've never seen that, right? That's like, this is almost more of like a history lesson, but it's something to think about. HIV can cause a myelopathy and a neuropathy. So that's something to think about. Adrenomyeloneuropathy. So adrenal leukodystrophy in, in pediatric neurology presents differently. That presents often like white matter disease in the brain. In adults, it can present as an adrenomyeloneuropathy, where you're gonna get um, that myeloneuropathy, so you're gonna get upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron features. It's rare, but it's something to think about. And then myopathy is always gonna be in the differential, because you're, you're talking about a patient who has painless weakness, right? And that's often how a myopathy, like an inflammatory myopathy, can present. Myasthenia gravis is gonna be in the differential, especially a patient with bulbar symptoms, right? So dysarthria and dysphagia, you're always thinking, when a patient presents that way, from a neuromuscular standpoint, you're often thinking myasthenia gravis, could this be ALS, possibly a myopathy, you know, inclusion body myositis can present with this dysarthria, dysphagia, um, that, or some of the genetic muscular dystrophies can do that, although it's rare. Um, but that's, those are things you're gonna be thinking about. Um, benign fasciculation syndrome, again, is gonna be another thing you think about, right? If a patient comes with just fasciculations, um, it's probably going to be more common than ALS, and you should have weakness in addition to those fasciculations. Um, Hirayama disease. Have you guys ever heard of Hirayama disease? So monomilic amyotrophy. So this tends to affect younger men, uh, most commonly of uh, Asian descent, and it's often going to be lower motor neuron weakness of like one arm. And so it becomes, so you develop this atrophy and weakness of an arm, and then it kind of just stabilizes and never progresses beyond that. And we actually think that it's involved, um, that there's a problem in the, uh, in the cervical spine um, and the actual spinal cord atrophies. And so you can actually do these flexion MRIs of the C-spine and you can, you can see um, abnormal signal. And so it's one way of diagnosing it. But it's something else to think about. And the prognosis is very different. They, they tend to have a, a fine prognosis. Uh, of course, they have a lot of morbidity because they, they become, they lose function in one arm, uh, but they don't really progress. So lower motor neuron ALS is a little bit harder to diagnose than upper motor neuron ALS, right? And then a classic ALS, because if you have classic ALS, so if you have like what I said before, right? If you have weakness and atrophy and in increased reflexes and a positive Hoffman sign in one limb, there's not a lot that causes that, right? That's extremely unusual. But if it's all lower motor neuron, then you, 
<clears throat> then there's other things to think about because then you could think about like a neuropathy, right? A motor neuropathy. You could think about a myopathy um, and that makes it a little more complicated. And then the classic tongue fasciculations, right? If you, if you see that, there's not a lot that causes that. Um, but if, if it's spinal onset and it's progressive muscular atrophy, um, that makes it much more complicated. So there's a hereditary differential diagnosis and then there's a more uh, uh, sporadic differential diagnosis. Uh, so one thing to think about is type four SMA. So these patients present in adulthood, typically like 30s to 50s, um, and they tend to develop um, weakness in the legs more than the arms. Um, and they have a normal lifespan, but they do lose the inability to run. And so they have a little bit of weakness, um, but it's gonna be this painless weakness that you see in ALS. And then Kennedy disease, which I've actually never seen, um, but it's a, it's a common test question. So every, all the time. Uh, so X-linked caused by an expansion of the CAG repeat and the androgen receptor gene. Um, so again, 30s to 60s, limb girdle muscular atrophy, uh, limb girdle uh, atrophy and weakness. And a classic presentation for them is they, also, they often have facial weakness and they often have dysarthria and dysphagia. Um, and uh, they often have gynecomastia and other, endo other endocrine uh, issues, which is not surprising given the repeat in the androgen receptor gene. Um, and interestingly, if you do a nerve conduction study on them, they actually have sensory abnormalities, which can be a little confusing, even though they don't complain of sensory complaints. So sporadic differential diagnosis of PMA. So a big one is multifocal motor neuropathy. So I had this one attending during a residency who used to, um, give IVIG to every new onset lower motor neuron only ALS, which I don't think is correct, right? But the idea was it's a hard diagnosis to make progressive muscular atrophy. There's no upper motor neuron signs. And so maybe they have this multifocal motor neuropathy. You guys have heard about this? I think I talked about it a little bit in my first peripheral neuropathy lecture. So the, the bigger name for it is multifocal motor neuropathy with conduction block. So on nerve conduction study, when you stimulate in two different areas, right? So you stimulate the median nerve at the wrist, and you guys have all had your nerve conduction study talks. And then at the forearm, right, over here in the antecubital fossa, you're gonna get a block. So you're gonna get a conduction block over here in the forearm. So the velocity here is gonna be 50, and the velocity here is gonna be 30. Or the amplitude here is gonna be 10, and the amplitude here is gonna be four. There's not a lot that causes that, right? So you can have a proximal median neuropathy, so you can have a neuropathy, um, so a compression at the ligament of Struthers or a compression at the pronator teres muscle, but that, that's pretty rare, right? Um, so if you see that conduction block, that's, that's something that's off. And that's often something that's inflammatory and demyelinating and, and autoimmune. And so if it's all motor, you think about this multifocal motor neuropathy. So these patients tend to be men more than women. Um, they tend to be a little younger. So I, I have a few patients in their 20s. Um, although it can happen in older patients, and it typically starts with weakness in a hand, and then it kind of can progress and affect the other extremities as well. And it's painless like ALS, right? There's no sensory involvement. Um, so it's, that's probably one of the biggest differentials to make. And early on in ALS, you might get more of upper motor, you might get more of lower motor neuron features before you get the upper motor neuron features. So again, that's when you're gonna think about this MMN. Um, other ways to diagnose it besides the EMG is that, uh, in 50% of cases, anti-GM1 is positive in the serum, so you can send that antibody. And if you do a MRI of the brachial plexus, you'll get contrast enhancement and you'll get T2 signal in about 50% of cases. This is a very rare variant of CIDP, pure motor variant. Um, that's also gonna be in the differential because there's no sensory aspect. There's this other variant called MADSAM of CIDP, so multifocal acquired demyelinating sensory and motor neuropathy. So it shouldn't be too confusing because you will get sensory loss um, and you'll get some sensory abnormalities. But again, this might present with hand weakness. So this is going to be in the differential of a ALS and a MMN, multifocal motor neuropathy. And then myasthenia gravis, as we talked about. Uh, primary lateral sclerosis. So if it's predominantly upper motor neuron, then you're going to have a different differential, right? So you're going to have the B12 and the copper deficiency that we talked about. Vitamin E can cause a myelopathy, vitamin E uh, deficiency. Um, you have cervical spondylitic myelopathy, which is always something to think about and actually quite common in the elderly, right? Um, anything causing, affecting the spinal cord, like a spinal cord tumor, HSP, like we talked about, um, HTLV1 myelopathy, which is at downstate more than anywhere else in the world, maybe. Um, 
and then things like neurosyphilis, uh, stiff person syndrome, uh, multiple, multiple cerebral infarcts, really just things that cause upper motor neuron features, right, and spasticity. So how do we diagnose ALS? So we talked about it, it's really a clinical diagnosis, right? So with some supporting features. So everyone should get an EMG nerve conduction study. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more um, in a slide or two. Um, should you do imaging? I, kinda, I think it depends on the presentation. So if someone's presenting with upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron features in an arm and a leg, and they have tongue fasciculations, I don't know if you need to get imaging, right? I think I probably do, but I don't know if you need to. Um, there's, no, there's no clear criteria that says this is what you need to do to diagnose ALS. Um, and there's no clear guidelines that say you need to get an MRI of the brain or an MRI of the C-spine. Same thing with labs, right? So common labs that are tracked are going to be a CK, which I think makes sense, right? You'd want to rule out a myopathy. In ALS, you can have an elevated CK, but it's usually not going to be above 1,000. It could be like 400, 500, but it shouldn't be much higher than that. Um, B12, again, because it can present as this myeloneuropathy, same with copper. Um, if anyone was at my other talk, the major focus I said was always to send off a serum protein electrophoresis and, and a serum immunofixation. HIV can present as a myeloneuropathy. It can also, HIV can sometimes be associated with actually motor neuron disease. So you'd want to check HIV as well. Um, and then ESR, CRP is kind of just a screen. These are common labs that can be checked. And then hypo and hyperthyroidism can present with a myopathy um, or a neuropathy. So it can be a little bit confusing. Other things you can think about are that anti-GM1, um, rheumatologic serologies, uh, perineal plastic panel, um, anti-MAG, which is seen in a, uh, a syndrome called DADS, uh, distal acquired demyelinating syndrome, which is a CIDP variant. That's not, that's a different presentation that usually presents with sensory ataxia in men in their 80s. Um, and then the myasthenia gravis labs are something to think about. Um, heavy metal screen can rarely present similarly, so I think it's something that some people will say can be considered. So when we're doing an EMG in ALS, we're looking for lower motor neuron dysfunction, right? EMGs aren't going to find any upper motor neuron issues. It looks at lower motor neuron. And in ALS, you want to find abnormalities in three different subsets, right? So three levels between cranial, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. So in the brainstem, we look for abnormalities in one muscle. And the most common way is actually doing an EMG of the tongue. So you can EMG the tongue by having the patient stick the tongue out and sticking the needle there, or you can have it by actually going through here. Is that, is that making you feel good? <laughs> so you could have it by going through here, which actually isn't painful. Um, and the tongue is right, right through the skin over here. And so you can just have the look at the tongue. And what you're looking for is you're looking for signs of active denervation. So that's gonna be fasciculation potentials, which are like the popcorn sound, right? And fibrillations and positive sharp waves, which is like rain on a tin roof. You guys saw that? in the uh, EMG talks, hopefully? Yes, maybe, no? Next year, next year. Um, and, and you're looking for signs of chronic re right? So chronic re means that there's damage to the nerves. And then what happens is, right, so you have all these different nerve fascicles going to the muscle. And in a neurogenic process, some of these nerve fascicles get injured and the remaining nerve fascicles take over. So those remaining nerve fascicles are gonna be large. So the in, an, in a neurogenic issue, which can be a nerve problem or a motor neuron problem, you're gonna get very large amplitudes, very prolonged durations. So that's what you're looking for. You're looking for signs of active denervation and chronic denervation at the same time. And you're looking for a problem in one of the cranial nuclei. So again, you can check the tongue, you can check the muscle, like the orbicularis oculi or oris. Um, you can check the paraspinal muscles in the thoracic, uh, at the thoracic level. And in the cervical and lumbosacral region, that's easier, right? Because you can check the arm and the leg. And you want to look for two different abnormalities and two muscles that are innervated by different roots and different nerves. So you're looking for more widespread damage. If you see that in three regions, then that might meet the ellis Gariel or Awaji criteria for ALS. And that'll provide a lower motor neuron evidence for ALS. You still need that upper motor neuron evidence clinically. Okay. So I think we just talked about all of this. So I'll skip ahead. So there's the revised ellis Gariel criteria. So this was the most common criteria we use for diagnosis of ALS. So there's clinically definite, where on clinical evidence alone, you have upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron signs in the bulbar region and at least two spinal or three spinal regions. So you need three of the four. Clinically probable is at least two regions. 
with upper motor neuron signs, <clears throat> rostral to lower motor neuron signs. And that's again for that cervical spondylitic myelopathy, right? You want the upper motor neuron signs above the lower motor neuron signs or syrinx, right, or large syrinx. Um, clinically probable laboratory supported ALS is where you have only one region, but then EMG criteria can play a role in that. And then clinically possible ALS, uh, where you have upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron dysfunction in one region or upper motor neuron signs found alone in two or more. So I think that there's a lot of critique of the ls criteria, and I think that it's this newer Awaji criteria that's not so new, it came out I think in 2008, um, was developed. So when they actually looked at studies to see if they, so the idea is that one of the problems with diagnosing ALS, and if you use the ls criteria to diagnose ALS, you'll often diagnose them like two months before they die. Um, which isn't that helpful, right? To get to a clinically definite ALS. So it's a little bit too stringent, right? So the idea was, how do we find a way to be specific like this is, this is very specific. You're not gonna, you're not gonna really diagnose someone with ALS unless they have ALS at this point, um, while being a little more sensitive at the same time and diagnosing it a little earlier. So that's, um, that's where we got the OWAGI criteria. Um, so we use the EMG nerve conduction study more in this criteria. Um, so it allows fasciculation potentials um, where the ls criteria did not. And um, there's a, the next slide will go through a little bit of the differences, but it really improved the sensitivity from 62% uh, to 81% based on one study, which is actually quite high. Um, so comparing the two, so in the ls you can only have fibrillations and positive sharp waves. In the LWG criteria, you can also use fasciculation potentials. Chronic denervation, which we talked about, you get those large units, you get reduced recruitment. That's going to be the same in both. Um, and just changing that really did, again, improve the sensitivity. And again, look, the specificity, if you really follow these criteria, is like too high. It's right, 99.5% is a really high specificity. And I think that's the issue, again, is that people are afraid to diagnose it. And using these criteria, um, you're diagnosing someone maybe two years after they started having signs and symptoms. Okay. So... Like in all things neurology, biomarkers would be wonderful, right? A serum biomarker could be really helpful in diagnosis. And we're actually, I think, pretty close. So one of the articles in this issue, The Current Opinions of Neurology, was about biomarkers. Um, so the light chain and the phosphorylated form of the heavy chain of neurofilaments um, actually have a pretty good sensitivity and specificity, and you can look at it in the serum and the CSF. So it's been used in research, but it hasn't been used clinically yet. Um, and so that's actually quite exciting. So um, this study looking at 455 patients um, found that this phosphorylated uh, heavy chain of neurofilament had an 83% sensitivity and 80% specificity. Um, so that might be a really useful tool that we have in the future. Um, and they actually found that higher levels were associated with shorter survival. Imaging can also potentially be helpful in the future. So in typical MRIs, we don't actually see much in an ALS patient. We might see a little bit of atrophy, um, especially if they have the frontotemporal dementia component of it, uh, but often we don't. Um, but we've known for years that if we looked at the white matter tracks through diff uh, diffuse tensor imaging, we actually do see abnormalities. Um, so once that becomes clinically available, I think that'll be helpful. And then there have been some studies looking at PET, um, FDG PET, where you can see hypometabolism and I'm not gonna go through all these regions, but in certain regions um, and hypermetabolism in others. And so, and th this kind of also points to that ALS is not just really affecting motor, right? We think of it as like painless motor weakness, but it, it's affecting the cortex too, and it's affecting areas that are non-motor. Um, and this, this attests to the fact that a lot of patients have these cognitive symptoms. Pathology, um, so I think this was on my like step one exam maybe these Bunina bodies, right? So you see these, cyto, uh, these eosinophilic, uh, eosinophilic uh, cytoplasmic inclusions. Um, you see anterior nerve root atrophy, and you see degeneration of the motor, of the motor neurons, um, as we talked about in the brain, the spinal cord, and the cranial nerves. Um, in most patients, we actually see TDP43 inclusions, which is another similarity with FTD. We see that in a lot of FTD patients as well. So treatment, uh, so there were practice parameters that were given by the European Federation of Neurologic Societies in 2012 and the American Academy of Neurology in 2009. And if anyone's been at the MDA clinic, you kind of, you know, you can get a sense of what we're able to offer these ALS patients. And it's more than just really the, the medications, right? There's a lot of symptomatic management that we can do. And that's really important. There was a good study a 
few years ago that actually showed that patients who go to a multidisciplinary clinic have an improved mortality compared to patients who don't. Um, and I, I think it was something like eight months, which is pretty significant in the ALS world. Um, and so having a multidisciplinary clinic where you have physiatrists, where you have physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, respiratory therapists, um, nutritionists, that's really all, all very important, um, speech therapists. So, you know, at our, and so there's, we have an MDA clinic, right? And so we see all types of muscular dystrophies and we also see ALS patients, which is a decent amount of our patients. And then there's separate ALS multidisciplinary clinics. And so in our clinic, you know, we have Dr. Stegever as a physiatrist, we have um, a respiratory therapist, we have an orthotist. So we have some factors, some, some of these components. When you go to the national MDA conference, you know, different places have different um, ancillary help. And so some places have more of like a psychologist, which could actually be really important, right? Um, psychiatry and neurology obviously have a lot of a intertwined connection. And that even goes to neuromuscular diseases. Um, so anyway, so this is really, really important. And so every ALS patient, and it's not possible in all of the United States, right? But somewhere in New York or somewhere where it is possible, it's really important that they attend a multidisciplinary clinic. So we have two medications, right? Um, Rylazole has been the, the one that's around forever, uh, anti-NMDA uh, properties and glutamate. Um, it has a modest effect. So generally we say that it helps about two to three months of survival. Um, up to about 12 months in some patients. Unfortunately, in a lot of those patients, it's going to be towards the end, right? So it, it might not be the best quality of life survival. Um, if, we can, if we can prolong survival by three months, I would prefer it to be closer to the beginning of the diagnosis. The newest medication is Adabarone. So this is a little bit of a controversy in the ALS world. It was approved in 2012 by the FDA based on a phase three trial in Japan. But a lot of clinics actually don't use Adabarone. We, we decided not to use it. The initial trial was actually negative, and then they, went, they did a sub-analysis. There was a small percentage of patients that did show some improvement. And so what they looked at was this ALS functional rating scale. And it's based out of 48 points. It's 12 questions. Each question has four points, a scale of zero to four, four being normal. Um, it looks at things like speech, salivation, swallowing, dressing, walking, dyspnea, climbing stairs, and a few others. And it showed a decrease of 2.49 fewer points. So there's some modest benefit there. The problem is that the inclusion criteria is like actually, it's, it's quite stringent. So patients need to be independently living. They need to do pretty well on all of the subscales. They need to have a forced vital capacity greater than 80%, which is actually quite high for ALS patients with any diaphragmatic involvement. Um, disease duration less than two years, so earlier di diagnosis. And over a 12-week observation, they need to have a decline of one to four points. Another reason we don't love this medication is because of the way it's administered. So it's an IV administration. The first time you give it, it's 14 days in a row, over 28 days. And then every subsequent month after that, it's 10 days out of the, out of the month where you have to kind of sit in a chair and get an IV, uh, IV administration for hours. Um, so from a, given the modest improvement, you know, a lot of neuromuscular uh, neurologists, we, we tend to feel that given the effect it has on quality of life, um, it's probably not a very new, exciting therapy. Um, but it is given in some centers um, and it is an option. So after those two medications, the rest of it's really supportive, although that can make quite a big difference. Um, so one of the important um, supportive managements we can do is respiratory manage, management, right? So when you get weakness of the phrenic nerve, you're gonna get diaphragm weakness. Um, that can lead to dyspnea, orthopnea, hypoventilation. It tends to affect sleep the most at first, right? When we're lying supine, the diaphragm tends to be more affected. Um, so what we offer most of our patients, most of our patients end up needing this, is non, I would say every patient ends up needing this, is non-invasive ventilation. Um, and we tend to use BiPAP, the bi-level positive airway pressure. Um, so the indications we have are forced vital capacity. So this is a maximum volume exhaled after maximal inspiration. So you, we do bedside spirometry with our respiratory therapist at the MDA center, at the MDA clinic. Um, so you inhale as much as you can, and then you exhale as much as you can. So if, it's la if that's less than 50% of predicted, um, or the NIF is below 60, then that's an indication for non-invasive ventilation. 
um, some patients will want more than that, right? So some patients, I have one patient who has had ALS for I think 25 years, um, and so he gets mechanical ventilation, um, and he's, he's in a wheelchair, um, and he can actually uh, communicate through eye movements. Um, so a small percentage, like five or 10%, will choose mechanical ventilation to prolong life. Most don't. The other thing is that a lot of these patients, uh, due to respiratory weakness, they have a problem, they have a hard time coughing, right? And so that can lead to increased secretions, that can lead to aspiration pneumonia. Um, so we often will provide a cough assist. Um, and that we do that also in the clinic where they try to inhale and then exhale as hard and fast as they can and see what that flow is. And if it's less than 270, um, we, we usually offer this um, cough assist. Other things we can do with ALS, a lot of them have sialuria. So glycopyrrolate and atropine drops, you know, are probably first line. I've never used amitriptyline, and I don't know if I love the idea of amitriptyline in an older patient with possible cognitive symptoms, uh, but, it, but some people say that it's helpful for uh, sialuria and ALS, uh, scopolamine patches, and then a decent amount of patients actually get Botox injections. Uh, so Dr. Stig Evers and Dr. Ansiska do that here, and I do that at Maimonides, uh, where we inject the parotid in the submandibular gland. Um, I've never seen this, uh, but if it's, if it's very, very severe, you can actually irradiate the salivary glands. Pseudobulbar palsy we talked about, and if you actually ask about it, a decent number of ALS patients will have this, probably about 40% or 50%. Um, and so if it's bothersome, you can give Nudexa, dextrometorphan and quinidine. Cramps, we have nothing for cramps in general, right? That's like a general treatment. We don't, we don't have anything for it. Some people swear by magnesium and there's no evidence for it. Um, I, get, I tend to get prescribed tonic water because it has some quinine and there's possible effect there. Um, the negative is that most people hate how tonic water tastes, um, but that's a potential. Um, insomnia, a lot of patients will have that and you can uh, symptomatically treat. Um, I've never given modafinil for fatigue but, um, to an ALS patient, but that's, that's something else you can do. Nutrition is probably one of the most important things and one of the most important things to counsel ALS patients about. Um, so weight loss is a poor prognostic sign. So you want to really make sure these patients are having high caloric, high protein diets. Um, and so things like Insure or if they have diabetes, Glucerna. Um, a lot of them have swallowing problems. So getting swallow um, evals for them and get, having them see a speech therapist is really important. There's this, I don't know if you've, uh, if you've been to the MDA clinic, you probably heard us talk about this chin tuck maneuver where you ch tuck the chin and then you swallow twice. That can help bring food down. Um, thickening liquids, as you guys know from stroke, can help, uh, can help with swallowing. And giving pe you know, inserting pegs or PRGs um, can actually be quite helpful. Um, communication, I talked about how you can have like the eye gaze communication, um, which is actually pretty cool. Um, you can also have text to speech applications, which you can get on iPhones or Androids. Um, or you can do voice banking before the dysarthria gets severe enough that you can't understand them. Okay, palliative care. We don't talk about this enough in neurology, right? But since my, uh, since my husband's doing a palliative care fellowship, I felt the need to talk about it. So palliative care is really important. Um, and it's really important in a lot of facets of neurology, but ALS is obviously one of them. So getting a palliative care team involved is crucial and helpful. All right, questions, comments? Thank you. No, we're just a lot of that. Oh, sure. that's okay. So like, Should I stop it, by the doing, way? Uh, a consult stuff. Uh -huh. um, is there any way I could get a hold of the slides for itself? Yeah. The slides are like, yeah. 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 yeah, of course. Uh, should I just shoot you an email okay. or? Just email me to remind me. At Downstate? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.